Thank you. And shall we perhaps begin with a prayer? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God our Father, we thank you for the joy of being gathered on this feast day of St John Henry Newman. We ask his presence, his protection for our country, and ask that he may inspire us and encourage us as Blessed Marie Eugène of the Child Jesus had such a deep spiritual friendship with him. We pray that the two may help us to come ever closer to the call to holiness that is given to each one of us. In a moment of silence, we bring our hopes, our needs, our prayers before the Lord. We ask Mary, our mother, to join us in prayer. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. It's a real joy to, to be with you all, um, and to be talking about a saint who is very close to me. I don't know who are the saints who particularly inspire you, the saints who you feel a particular spiritual friendship with. I put in our, our parish newsletter uh, a week ago uh, an invitation to, to share that with someone. Uh, I said, you know, one of the things that really inspires me, that really encourages me in my faith, is to hear about other people's relationship with the saints to hear about the saints that really inspire them, the saints that they feel particularly close to. Um, and I find very often that that helps me to understand that saint better, reveals a dimension of them that I hadn't seen before. Uh, I love hearing about that in, in other people. And so one of the gifts this week has been that many of my parishioners have been sharing that with me. Um, I'm, I'm, I should have said I'm, I'm parish priest in, in Taunton. Um, I've just, just begun in Taunton and Wellington uh, 10 days ago, so very new parish priest. And, um, and it's been a wonderful way to discover more deeply some of my parishioners in hearing more about those saints who inspire them. Today we have the, the feast of St John Henry Newman. And I think it's not a coincidence that we're beginning this year on his feast day. St John Henry Newman, who I think was very close to Blessed Marie Eugène, um, and who really in inspired him, um, and who, of course, is particularly close to us in, in England. He's someone I got to know as a child because my grandmother had a, a very deep spiritual friendship with, with Newman. In fact, so much so that my, my brother, uh, hearing my grandmother talking so much about Newman, um, said that when he was a child, he thought that Newman was a friend of the families, <laughs> which I guess he was in a way, which I think is, is rather lovely. Um, and I think, yeah, I learnt to know and um, to, to be more attached to, to, to Christ through Newman, thanks to my grandmother. And today I've been asked to, to give a testimony. So it's not so much a sort of an academic talk or, or, or a, a talk of, you know, sharing information, but rather sharing experience, sharing something of my friendship with this, this wonderful um, saint, Blessed Marie Eugène of the Child Jesus. And of course, that's something that's quite deeply personal. It's something that's, that's, that's mine and, and, and my experience. But I think and I hope that there's something there that might help you in your journey. Um, I think there's something in that, in that shared uh, friendship that's, that can speak to the heart. Um, you know, they say that we, we don't choose the saints, they choose us. Um, and I think so often that, that's true. And unexpectedly, I find there's a saint who's really kind of come in, into my life. And I think that's very much been the case for me with Blessed Marie Eugène. 
Um, some of you will know him very well, and so others perhaps not so well at all. So forgive me, because either I'll be, I'll be sort of teaching my grandmother to suck eggs and, and, and really giving you stuff that you know so well already, or you'll be thinking, what on earth is he talking about? Um, I hope I'll, I'll, I'll kind of get the right level. Um, so, uh, to digress, you have to pray that I don't digress too much, because it's a, a great kind of temptation of mine. Um, there's a priest friend of mine who went into a primary school and he was asked to give this, this talk about prayer. And um, he'd, he'd prepared, he's someone who's not very spontaneous, he likes to prepare things and be quite structured. So he prepared a wonderful talk on, on prayer. And he got into the school and he realised that the, the children were a bit younger than he expected. And he thought, you know, what do I do? He thought, well, I'll just carry on and give the talk and hope for the best. So he gave this talk and at the end, he said, have you got any questions? And uh, the children all looked at him and all a bit kind of um, blank. Um, and the one, one little girl took pity on him and put her hand up and he's, he was really pleased. So he said, yeah, what, what's, what's your question? And uh, she said, my favourite colour's red, what's yours? <laughs> <laughs> so I'll find out at the end what to... Um, but yes, to get stuck in. Um, Blessed Marie Eugène, as um, you probably already know, was, was a Carmelite priest. Um, and who did in a lifetime, um, well, or did rather in his life, what, what would be many people's lifetimes, I think, several times over. Um, he was first of all um, ordained as, well, first of all, he was uh, fought in the war. Um, he was in the First World War and in the Second World War. Um, he had a call to priesthood when he was very young. Um, he went to a junior seminary run by a religious order, then joins the, the diocese uh, in Rodez, where he was. He was ordained a priest to, to Rodez, but even before his ordination, he had a very clear sense of calling to become a Carmelite. And so just a few days after he was ordained the diocesan priest, he went and, and joins the Carmelites. Um, and then he um, was, had a remarkable life as a Carmelite um, in, in various different convents um, and with very significant responsibilities at the heart of the Carmelite order. Uh, he wrote his great masterwork, uh, I Want to See God, um, this, this remarkable synthesis of the spiritual life. Um, and he founded Notre Dame de Vie, this, this wonderful secular institute. Um, which, as, as Monique was saying, I'm, I'm joining, which I feel so incredibly blessed by. Um, so you probably might have known all of that already. Um, and there's so much more that we could say about him. Um, but you can see perhaps that there's a bit of overlap between his life and mine. Um, I think he's someone who's, whose life really, yeah, has this very deep coherence with his teaching. Um, you can see that, that authenticity um, that speaks to the heart. Um, you know, that, that, that old um, saying, you know, I, I can't hear what you're saying because um, your actions are speaking too loudly. Um, sometimes um, we, can, we can have a, a, an incoherence between our, our, what we say and what we live. I think the beauty of Marie Eugène is this profound coherence between what he says and what he lives. And this, this profound integrity in his life, um, he, he follows very deeply where God is calling him to. And sometimes that is very costly and very challenging. And you can see that. Um, I think two moments I would pick out. One is the moment of his call to become a Carmelite. And as Monique was, was sharing at the beginning, we're celebrating a um, hundred years um, since that, that moment when he was ordained a priest and then very shortly afterwards enters the, the Carmelite novitiate um, this, this coming year. And that's, that's a real challenge for him because he'd envisaged his calling, obviously, to, to be a diocesan priest. Um, and not only that, his mother had very much envisaged that as his calling. Um, and she'd had enormous sacrifices that she'd made. He doesn't come from a wealthy background. He comes from a, a family who really work hard and his mother who has really um, done all sorts of jobs to pay for him to go to junior seminary and to be able to pursue his path to priesthood. 
And she has this, this vision, this dream, that she will be able to accompany him, um, to be kind of like a housekeeper for him and to, to retire, to, to, to be staying with him in a, in a, uh, a nice country parish somewhere in, in the Diocese of Rodez. Um, and it's beautiful, you know, to be mother and son together and, and this lovely dream. And of course, that's going to be shattered um, by him joining the Carmelites. And she finds that so hard to accept. You can imagine how heart-wrenching it is for her to let go of that, that dream, to let go of her son. Um, and she really resists this vocation and puts every obstacle she can in the way. Um, to the point at which she says, you know, when he's going to leave um, to, to join the Carmelites, that um, she'll commit suicide if, if he actually goes. Um, and you can imagine how difficult that, that is for him, who is so attached to his mother. And of course, his bishop isn't wildly keen on him going off to become a Carmelite. Um, this is not the, the, the church of today where, where there's... there's um, bishops are really kind of struggling to find priests to fill parishes. But even so, this is a, a priest who um, the bishop can, can really see a, a role for in, in his diocese. Um, he's, he's really not keen to, to let him go just after his ordination. And yet, um, Blessed Marie Eugène, through his faithfulness, through his listening to the Holy Spirit, really finds that God, in following God's call, a pathway opens and he's able to follow that call. And I think that speaks very much to me. I'm sure it perhaps speaks to you in those moments in our hearts and our lives when we feel a very deep sense of call to something, when we feel that God is, is really kind of leading us somewhere. And yet sometimes there are obstacles, there are challenges, and sometimes we can get discouraged. Um, you see that, you know, in the life of, of, of Peter, um, that, that moment when he is um, hearing God, Jesus' call to step out of the boat. Uh, he sees Jesus walking on the water and his first instinct is to, to, to get out of the boat and to walk towards Jesus. And to begin with, everything goes well. And then we know what happens. He hears the storm, he hears the waves, he hears the wind, and he takes his eyes off Jesus. And instead he looks at the fears, he looks at the obstacles. And that's the moment when he begins to sink. Um, and I don't know if you've experienced that in your own lives. Those moments when perhaps we felt a call, we felt God drawing us somewhere. And perhaps instead we've turned our eyes towards the fears, towards the obstacles, towards the, the challenges, um, and perhaps almost given up on, on, on the calling. And I think that beautiful way in which God doesn't give up and continues to call and, and, and Jesus reaches out and, and lifts Peter um, back into, into the direction, into the path he's called to. I think for me, I've, I've I felt this call to Notre Dame de Vie for a long time. Uh, this call to become uh, what we call a priest of Notre Dame de Vie. So I'm, I'm a diocesan priest, I'm a priest of the Diocese of Clifton. Um, and that's, that's very much you know, my, my calling and, and um, as a diocesan priest um, to, to be sent wherever my bishop sends me. So um, to be at the moment as, as a parish priest in, in Taunton and Wellington. Um, but alongside that, that call, I felt for a long time a call to, to something else, um, a call to, to live more deeply at that contemplative dimension of, um, of my priestly heart and, and, and ministry. Um, and I came to know Notre Dame de Vie a long time ago um, and really felt very drawn to um, to their charism and, 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 and life. But, like perhaps you've experienced and like um, Blessed Marie Eugène experienced, there are of course obstacles and, and, and challenges that often come and, and, and face us. Um, and I think, for me, obviously one of the challenges is it's, it's quite hard for a bishop to release a priest. Um, so to join Notre Dame de Vie as a, as a priest, you, you do a two-year initial formation 
uh, of which the first year you spend uh, on site in, in Notre Dame de Vie in, in Venesque. And um, yeah, so the, the bishop concretely has to say, you know, I'm going to let you go for a year to go and do this. Um, and that's, that's not easy um, for a bishop, particularly at the moment where there's, there's a real challenge in finding priests and, and, and to, to kind of um, be in parishes. Um, in my last appointment, I was parish priest of Nelson Portis Head, and there I replaced two parish priests. Um, in, in my current appointments, I'm, I'm basically essentially going to be replacing free, free priests. And you can see the way in which, yeah, um, in that kind of context, for Bishop to say, yeah, um, you can go for a year is, is a real act of faith. And I think, yeah, in the midst of that, um, it's very easy to, um, to see the, the, the wind, the waves, the things that, that, that takes away. But I think what's really kept me going was this sense of this being God's calling and God quietly keeping that sense of calling um, in my heart. Um, and then, almost to my astonishment, um, the bishop saying yes um, and saying, yeah, no, you, you can go and, and, and do this. Um, and so this year, which Blessed Marie Eugène gives us a wonderful kind of description of, he gives this this beautiful kind of spiritual testimony for, for, for priests. I'd just like to, to read it to you because I think it's something that really spoke to my heart. He says, every priest before or after becoming a priest needs to spend time in solitude in order to realize the living and acting presence of the Holy Spirit in the church and in his soul and to learn to render his action in docile harmony with that of the Holy Spirit. He, sh he should take every possible step to perfect this docile attitude. The Institute of Priests of Notre Dame de Vie wants to respond to these needs. I find that such a powerful statement, this, this year, which I just feel so blessed to have had, to listen more deeply to the Holy Spirit, to be, become more docile to the action of the Holy Spirit, to really allow myself to be, to be led um, and, and moved by the Spirit. Um, that way in which you can see that, that, that phrase in Romans 8 is so deeply rooted in, in Blessed Marie Eugène's heart. Um, this, this wonderful sense of, of being uh, led and, and moved by the Spirit. Um, and I think this is a gift that he so deeply wanted to share with each one of us. Um, and I think in a, in a particular way um, with, with, with priests, in, in, um, it's something that I, I experienced very profoundly this year. Um, and every day I would wake up with this amazing sense of joy and gratitude for the depth of the gift um, of being able to take a year to be more deeply in prayer and silence, to be listening to God. Um, and how deeply that has helped me um, to, to live my priesthood. Um, and I think it's something that will profoundly impact on my, my life and ministry in, in the years ahead. We spent a year, um, that, that first year at Vernesk, um, really to, to be grounded um, in the heart of Notre Dame de Vie. Um, I think one of the gifts that, that Blessed Marie Eugène gives us is this, this openness to the Spirit. He says, you know, there are lots of things. There's this wonderful retreat he gives at the end of his, towards the end of his life. And he says, you need to have this constant openness to the work of the Holy Spirit. It's very easy to get rooted, you know, and I don't know about you, we, we can get very fixed in our habits, in our way of doing things, and... Um, I remember a few years ago, I had a, a priest who came to, to, to live with me for a year. And um, I realised how rooted I got in one of my habits was I'd always um, turn my, 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 uh, my, my coffee machine off on the machine and he would turn it off at the plug on the wall. Um, and, and I can't tell you how much that annoyed me. Um, and I realised how much I was kind of, yeah, um, unconverted um, and, and set in my ways.
Um, and often I think we, we get more like that as we get older. Um, and so often we, 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 we get stuck in, in our rhythm and pattern. Um, and um, and Blessed Marie Jeanne says, you know, there are some things which are absolutely essential to Notre Dame de Vie. Basically, um, having two hours of silent prayer every day. So this is at the heart of, of Notre Dame de Vie. Um, these two hours of, of listening and, and, and spending those, th that time in God's presence. Um, and that's, that's at the core. Um, and of course, the gift of, of being at Vanessa was that you could spend more time and, and, and have extra hours, but at least to have those, those two hours every day. Um, and then to come back into, into solitude, into silence, um, for at least, for us as, as priests, at least three weeks um, every year. Um, and I think the beauty of that is that that supports your apostolate, so that you're, all that you're doing, um, whether it's as, as, as a lay member of uh, Notre Dame de Vie, whether it's as a priest, your action, because that's the other part of, of Notre Dame de Vie, it's, it's not purely contemplative. Um, you, it's very much, uh, he said, that's the other essential element, that there's, there's an apostolate, you're called to go out into the world and, and to be doing things. Um, but it's rooted profoundly in the contemplation. Um, and the two come together in this amazing way. Um, and I think he said, that's, that's essential. That's, that's the core of what we're about, um, is that, that, that synthesis of the active and the contemplative. And of course, that goes right back to Elijah um, and that wonderful um, yeah, way in which Elijah is both active and contemplative. Um, yeah, I could, I could say much more about Elijah, but I'm, I'm, I'm very conscious that um, my, yeah, I don't want to, to, to go on too long um, and, and send you completely to sleep. Um, but um, yes, I think he says that's the core, that's what stays the same. But the rest, you have to have this dynamism in the spirit. You have to be moved in the spirit um, to listen very deeply to what's happening in the world around you. Um, there's, there's a risk that you can stay um, very fixed in, 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 in a comfortable um, pattern that, that, that you're, you're, you like and, and yeah. And you have to be constantly uh, moved by the spirit. One of the things that I think really spoke to me, particularly this year, it's something that I, I really yeah, was, was drawn to before, but I think in a particular way spoke to me this year, is what he has to say in I Want to See God, um, that, that, that wonderful spiritual masterwork, about um, gift of self, about how we give ourselves um, in a way that's kind of unconditional and in a way that's not too determined uh, that's, when I was ordained a priest, um, there's this amazing moment, um, for those of you who've been to priest ordinations, where, where you lie flat on the floor and you give yourself completely to God and you have the litany of the saints and this amazing kind of moment. Um, and, you know, I was talking about friendship with the saints at the beginning. Um, and so there's, there's a kind of standard litany of the saints that you have. Um, and then you can normally add one or two extras. Uh, onto the list, saints that you, you feel particularly close to. Well, I, I kind of wanted to add a whole page of saints. Um, and um, my rector at seminary said, well, that's great, but you know, really, uh, the, the priests have to be kneeling on the floor while you do this. You know, it's quite a hard wooden floor. Is there any chance you could cut down the list a bit? You know? and, and, um, I said, well, yeah, I'd love to, but uh, it's hard to kind of leave out some of my friends in heaven. Um, and much to, to, to my gratitude, he let me keep them all in. Um, so it was quite a long time I was lying on the floor and, and really kind of giving my, my, myself completely to God. And then I got up again and I started taking it back um, in small ways, you know, that way in which you think, well, yeah. Um, in subtle ways, I think we can be tempted to take back a complete gift of ourselves. We can think, yeah, if I really give everything to God, uh, is he going to take this as well? And, and what about that? And, uh, 
and the subtle temptation to, to kind of do our lives to do for me as a priest, my ministry, on my terms, full of, of goodwill and, and, and good things, but to want to be in control of where that's going. And I think one of the gifts that Blessed Marie Eugène gives us is to surrender control, to say, really, Lord, you know, I'm going to step out in faith and I, I don't know quite where that's going to lead me. I don't know quite where you're going to take me, but I'm going to trust more deeply in where that's, that call will, will go. And amazing things can come out of that. And out of things which seem quite unpromising. One of the moments I think that really happens in, in Blessed Marie Eugène's life is when he's called to leave a very fruitful apostolate uh, in, in Lille, where he's, he's very happy, he's really kind of doing great work, he's, he's really kind of doing great things. And he's called by his superiors to go to an apostolate he really doesn't believe in, um, to be superior of a kind of junior seminary for the Carmelites. Um, at Le Petit Gestelet, which he, he, his belief is that actually to be a Carmelite, you have to be an adult. Um, it's not a vocation that you can really get as a teenager. You need a, a spiritual maturity. And, and, and uh, so he doesn't really believe in, in junior seminaries. And, and, and so this is, this is something that he's really, uh, you can imagine, you know, going to uh, something that you don't really believe in, you're not really convinced is a great idea, um, when you're really happy. Uh, this is quite a challenging thing to take up, but he goes in obedience. He trusts in that this is God's working through his superiors. And sure enough, actually no one uh, from that junior seminary ends up becoming a Carmelite. Um, it's quite a dry and, and challenging place to be in many ways. And yet, from that obedience comes this astonishing spiritual fruitfulness. Um, through the encounter he's able to have with free women who will become those who, who found Notre Dame de Vie with him, um, our, our, our free founders. And there's, I think, he clearly he, he has no sense that that's going to happen. He has no vision of that at that time. And yet through his trust, through his obedience to God speaking through his religious superiors, something amazing um, takes place. And I think that's something very powerful that I've seen again and again in my own life, that things which have seen really quite challenging, quite dry and, and really quite difficult, um, that I've stuck with without really understanding why, without really seeing where God's been at work, have, have led in completely unexpected ways to an astonishing spiritual fruitfulness. I think one of those gifts that he gives us is perhaps that gift of perseverance um, in, in those ministries, in those, those moments in our lives, when perhaps we don't really understand what God's doing, when we're really not sure of, of what's, what's going on and it seems really quite challenging. Um, I think that that trust that God has a plan and is working through this, um, you know that wonderful moment in, with the apostles where they're caught up in the storm and there's this real kind of huge storm and the winds and the waves and they're, they're completely lost. And then at the end of the storm, they reach the other side and they end up very close to the place they were headed for. I think that's such a beautiful image to stay with. Uh, those moments when we seem very caught up in the storm and yet we know that Jesus is there and Again and again, I found that somehow I end up at the end of the storm, very close to the place I was headed for. Um, that, that wonderful gift that the Lord gives us. Um, I think, yeah, I've been speaking for quite a while. Um, maybe, um, yeah, I don't know, Monique, do I have time to take... It's okay. It's okay? Do I have time to take questions? Yes. Fantastic. I don't know if you have any questions. My favourite colour isn't red, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, or anything that you'd like to share? 
Jean. Um, how does your, your call to Notre Dame de uh, influences uh, your priesthood? I know well, we're not priests, so maybe that's not maybe extremely relevant, but I think if we have the church at heart, uh, we ought to think about, uh, yeah, so if you, can, mm. if you can repeat the question, so the uh, video. Will sure, and it also helps me to understand that I've got the question right. Um, so the question was, how does my belonging to Notre Dame de Vie influence my life as a priest? Um, and I think it, it, it goes, I suppose, back to the baptismal priesthood that we all share. Um, I think the beauty of belonging to Notre Dame de Vie is that we're part of a spiritual family um, which has uh, three branches, so one for, for, for priests like myself, one for, for men and women, um, and beautifully families who, who share in that charism of, of Notre Dame de Vie. Um, and what a joy to, to have a family here who, who um, are, are sharing that life of, of Notre Dame de Vie. Um, and I think there's a very deep sense of communion in that. And that it's wider, that it's not just those who have a formal sense of belonging to Notre Dame de Vie. There are also many friends in, in all sorts of, of loose senses of the term who are helped by that, that charism, which I think is, is ultimately about living the life, the call to holiness that each of us has through our baptism. Um, and that's, that's, that's what, of course, um, our, our baptismal priesthood is about. And that's what our call, my call to ministerial priesthood is, is based on that call to, to holiness. Um, and my call as a, as a priest, uh, as, as an ordained priest, is to serve your call um, to share in that life of God, that amazing call that you had in your baptism. I mean, isn't that amazing? At your baptism, you became a child of God. Um, and how often perhaps we lose that sense of awe and wonder at, at the greatness of, of who we are. Um, I love St. Josephine Bikita, uh, who every day went back to the font where she was baptised and used to kiss the font and say, this is where I became a child of God. I think that's just amazing. Uh, that joy that she had, this is where I became a child of God. Um, and I think what Notre Dame de Vie as a charism helps us to do is embrace more and more deeply that, that life as a child of God, that life in the Holy Spirit. Um, that life very deeply united to, to God. Um, and so all of us, members of Notre Dame de Vie, um, so those who are, uh, are consecrated members of Notre Dame de Vie, share that charism of the two hours of, of silent prayer, which of course is, is the Carmelite charism, um, and, and live that in the world. Um, and I think that's so powerful that I'm, I'm, I'm sharing that, that very deep spiritual communion with, with uh, so many brothers and sisters, and I feel very much part of that, that kind of spiritual family. Um, so I think that's one of the gifts, that I'm part of a spiritual family, um, that it's, it grounds me in that family, um, and that there's a, a real support. Um, and I think that's, that's so important for me as a priest. Um, I'm very conscious of how easy it can be for priests to be isolated. Um, I have one of my neighbours is a priest who is an hour's drive away and I'm the closest priest to him. Um, and so physically, if he wants to meet another priest, the closest priest is, is an hour's drive. And you can imagine, you know, that's quite a commitment of, of time, of energy. Um, and of course, you know, there's, there's, there's people in the parish and, and, and yeah, but I think there's something also that we're called to live as, as brother priests um, that can be a real challenge. Um, as we're, we're geographically further apart, as we often find our diaries get quite full, finding that time and that space uh, for priesthood fraternity, I think, is, is really important. And I think that's one of the gifts of Notre Dame de Vie. With the other priests of Notre Dame de Vie, with my brothers and sisters from, from the other branches of Notre Dame de Vie, but also within the diocesan priesthood. Um, and I think one of the, the, the charisms of Notre Dame de Vie and, and wi more widely of secular institutes is to foster that communion 
with other priests um, within the diocese. And I think that's, that's something that I feel a real kind of heart for, um, to, to be, yeah, building that spiritual friendship with, with brother priests in the diocese and supporting and encouraging each other um, in, in our call to, to priesthood. Um, so I think that's, that's one of the concrete ways. Um, I think very much at the heart of what drew me to the end of years I was sharing is that that, that, that integration um, of action and contemplation um, and getting that right I think is so important. Um, there can be I think a temptation to go I think all of us are called, you know, to, to, to both, but we can be tempted to, to go too far in uh, perhaps one way or the other. Um, or there can be huge pressures on us. Um, and particularly as a Dawson priest, to be caught up so much in the action um, that you lose that, that contemplative heart of, of who, you're, who you are and who you're about. And I think the commitment to the two hours of silent prayer, the commitment to having the, the three weeks of, 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 of going back to, to one of our, our, our centres each year grounds you very deeply in that. And you have someone you're accountable to for it. Um, and I think that's, that's really powerful um, and, and quite transformative. I think having priests who really understand that, who really live the charism, that you can talk to and, and be in communion with really helps in, in living that out. So I think that's, yeah, one of the very concrete ways. I think I'm also conscious, I'm saying this and feeling very little in, in speaking about this because I'm just starting. I've, I've literally just done the first year of formation. Uh, I'm just, you know, I've been 10 days in my new parish and, and starting out. And probably, you know, if you ask me the question again in a year's time, in 10 years' time, I'll probably be able to give you a more developed answer. Um, perhaps there's something good about being very little and, and small. Um, I hope I hold on to that. Um, but yeah, I, that gives you a beginning of, a, of an answer. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so um, I, I have slightly insomniac tendencies. So yeah, middle of the night is great um, because nothing else happens. And, and um, so I, I have um, often I'll wake up in the night and, and do an hour, um, but that's not sort of one of my timetabled hours. So my, my timing at the moment, I'm, I'm still finding my feet slightly. Um, the, the first hour is very easy um, because I do that when I get up. So I do six or seven um, and usually nothing else happens during that hour. It's, it's, it's great. You know, the church is really quiet. I can go in and um, my assistant priest isn't out of bed. So yeah, <laughs> it's really quiet. Um, uh, the second hour is more challenging um, and I'm still working out when that happens. So, for example, this, this week I'd, I was sitting down and, and doing it six or seven. I had a nice slot in my diary. And then suddenly at half past six, the lights came on in the church um, and I realised there's a choir practice that happens on Thursday night. <laughs> um, so that wasn't so good. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm just sort of working out. I, at the moment, I'm, I'm doing it um, late afternoon. Um, because I often find that's quite a good slot before evening things happen. Um, but sometimes, you know, when I'm on an all-day course, I find that I'm doing it later in the evening after things are finished. Um, what I do is I have it in my diary. Um, I have an electronic diary, and if I find there's something else in the diary, then that I really can't, you know, I'm, I don't know, there's a meeting with the bishop or whatever, then I, I move that prayer slot to somewhere else, but I always make sure that it's, it's there in, in the day. And I think the fact of having it in the diary means if I'm putting something else in, I've got to actually fit it in because it's a non-negotiable. So the timing of the afternoon slot might move, but the fact of it happening won't. Um, ah, yeah, I, it's interesting talking to other priests about how they do it. Some of them say, on days when it's really full, they'll do both hours early in the morning. Um, 
others will, will have different ways of, of, of doing it. Um, and I think it's, it, it is a challenge um, because, yeah, we, uh, we are pulled in, 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 in different directions. Um, but I think, for me, I can see how essential it is. Um, and I think the gift of being part of the Thunder V is, is saying, actually, no, this is, this is something that really has to happen um, in my day. Um. Can I ask how you were called to Notre Dame de Vie? Yeah, so um, slightly... Please question. Yes, yeah, sorry, yeah, thank you. Um, so just to repeat the question, um, I was asked how was I called to Notre Dame de Vie? Um, it came through the Carthusians, so that the Carthusian monks, um, who spoke to me about Notre Dame de Vie. I'd, I'd never heard of Notre Dame de Vie. Um, I'm, 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 yeah, that's, don't have much wider experience. Um, and I was in seminary, um, so this was back in 2007, um, and yeah, the Carthusians spoke to me about Notre Dame de Vie, um, and this really appealed to me. I thought, this, there's something here that, that really um, grabbed me, and, and, um, and so, like lots of people these days, I um, typed into Google Notre Dame de Vie um, <laughs> and came up with the page. And I thought, yeah, this, this really um, attracts me. So um, there was an email address, um, and I emailed the priest who was uh, responsible then and said, I've just found you know, your website. Is there any chance I can come and, and, and visit? And he said, yeah, by all means. So I, I came for a retreat. Um, and and really loved it, and then came back, and I used to go pretty much all my, my holidays, you know, and, and go back for retreats to to Venice, the, the sort of mother house of, of Notre Dame de Vie. Um, and then I did my, my retreats before ordination there as well, um, and yeah, and and it became really quite yeah more and more clear that this was um, really where yeah I felt a very strong calling to. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that's so often the case that, that God speaks in unexpected ways and through unexpected people. And it's fascinating talking to others about how they encounter the Thunder V. And, and so often that's the case. You know, that there are some who have a fairly you know, classic path of you know, having been in the Thunder V prayer group or something like that or, or, or a retreat. Uh, but others who come in from wildly unexpected and, and surprising paths. Um, I think often that sense of the Holy Spirit, sense of humour that <laughs> God really kind of works and, 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 and chooses all sorts of different characters. Um, I think, yeah, and I think that's one of the richnesses of being part of a spiritual family with such a diverse cast of characters. Um, I remember when I started in, in, in seminary, there was someone um, who, who said to me, yeah, if I had a choice, uh, there's some of the people I'm in seminary with who I wouldn't share a taxi with. Um, <laughs> um, and um, yeah, I definitely wouldn't say that about the Tolan Navi, but, um, but, but it's, it's been wonderful. And one of the richnesses, you know, I was doing this, this, this year in the Viciate. Um, there were 11 of us from seven different nationalities, um, four different continents, um, and, and a yeah, huge diversity of, of backgrounds, um, and this wonderful sense of the universal church. Um, and what a gift that's, that's been for me. Um, and to be able to, to, to live that and, and that spiritual friendship together is, is, is really precious. Sorry, as, as you've probably noticed, I give very long answers to short questions. Um, Thank you, Molly. Not at all. Thank you so much. Not at all. Testimony. Oh, a real privilege. This was what you mean? Yeah. So Father Kevin is very much. A bit more about him? Yes, of course. And how he came to be a profane saint? Yes. So the question is, um, could I say a little bit more about um, Blessed Marie Eugène and how he came to be proclaimed a saint? Um, so I gave you a very brief biographical sketch. Um, I think, yeah, he was um, proclaimed a saint quite recently. It was 2000, well, sorry, he was beatified quite recently in 2016. 
um, and it's still in the process of being canonised. So I think this is really exciting because it's so contemporary. Um, and you can see um, he's someone who's um, very much within the lifetime of, of many people around. Monique um, knew Marie Eugène um, and was a, was a novice um, at the time when he was, he was there. Um, it'd be lovely if, if you were uh, to share. Um, yeah, would you like to say something about him? Um, no. Would you like to say something about Blessed Marie Eugène and how he struck you in, in the novitiate? Oh, yes, yes, yes. But Notre Dame de Ville, I met him three times because he wanted to, I uh, went for one year to enter in Notre Dame de Ville. And personally, I was not able to enter in Notre Dame de Ville. I felt a call from God, but I was not able to do. And the fact that he told me, wait for one year, after I was able to enter immediately in Notre Dame de Ville. So I struggled with him to enter in the same year. And finally, he told, uh, I think uh, this opposition is not coming from yourself, but it's coming from the Holy Spirit. So you enter. But before, he met Marie Pilar, the co founders with him. Beautiful. Um, and sorry for those who are um, following on, on YouTube, or whatever, because that probably didn't, didn't register. Um, but just to repeat for, for those who are doing that, uh, Monique sharing this, this wonderful sense of, of um, her discernment with Blessed Marie Eugène um, and the challenges she had in, in entering um, Notre Dame de Vie. Um, and, and how he said, yeah, this is, this is coming from the Holy Spirit. Um, and you could see. Um, his, his deep listening to the Holy Spirit. Um, and, and I think that's, that's one of the great gifts that's, um, that he gives us. He's, um, it was fascinating. We, we, we got to speak to um, the, the postulator or the vice postulator for, for his cause and others who've worked on the cause of canonization. And I think that's quite exciting. You know, I don't know if you've ever met people who've been working on, on the cause of a saint. Um, but quite fascinating to, to, to hear about the process. Um, and they have to gather all the evidence of, of miracles um, as, as part of that process. Um, and very moving to, to hear the stories of some of those, those miracles. Um, and how people have prayed uh, and asked for the intercession of, of Blessed Marie Eugène um, and found, yeah, some amazing things happening. Um, I would encourage you if you need a miracle, pray and, and ask his, his intercession and then let the postulation know. I mean, it might be your miracle. Wouldn't that be amazing? Um, I'm sure you, you all know that the stories of the, um, those who were healed um, for the, the canonization of, of St. John Henry Newman. Um, oh, wasn't that amazing that they, 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 they were, um, oh, what was the name of the, the lady um, who was um, for, for the canonization of John Henry Newman, who was there? Um, oh, it's gone out of my head. This is old age, I'm forgetting names. And, um, but yeah, you, you see those, those wonderful stories of people who, yeah, who've been healed or, or, or granted amazing favours um, through the intercession of a saint. Um, I think to say, if you haven't yet read his, his kind of spiritual masterwork, I want to see God. Um, it's so powerful and, and so worth going through. Now, in English, it's published in two volumes. I want to see God and I am a daughter of the church. Um, and yeah, the translation isn't great, to be honest. Um, it could do with, yeah, being revised. Um, but it, it is so worth reading. Um, and um, yeah, but there are other books um, which have been translated into English. And if you want something lighter to begin with, um, there's, there's um, uh, how's it translated into English, that, that, the title? Um, sorry? Yeah, it's, it, um, it's, it's um, oh. do you know how it's, um, Sous le souffle de l'esprit is, is where the Spirit Breathes is a lovely place to begin. Uh, but here is Father Kelvin, his foot on the Holy Spirit. Um, and so, a very, very warm welcome to you.
among us, there are some the people who attend the beatification Oh, what a grace that was. Mm. Yes, Paolo, mm. Lindsay, Christine, John. Yes. Sorry. If I might add, Father, I, I did read a book very briefly. It was just on a Sunday afternoon. I, actually, it was one of Odile's. And it was just a generalisation of his life. And I think his military service, because he, um, his experiences in, in the First World War, particularly, mm. I think he got quite a high rank in, a high rank in the French army. But I think he was, you know, that, um, had a big bearing on his life. Yeah, I yeah. In the military, yeah. Well, I know. Absolutely, and yeah, I yeah. I remember a bit about his mother being very upset. So you've brought that back to me. Um, and just for those following on the video, that, that was a reminder of, of the impact of um, Blessed Marie military service on his life. Um, and in the First World War, where he interrupted his, his, his seminary studies uh, to, to be in the military, um, and then in, in the Second World War again, um, and how much of an impact that, that, that had on him. Um, um, and I think you're, thank you for, for, for raising that, because I think that, that really was very significant for him um, and yeah the, the way in which so many people around him died and, yeah. and the suffering that he saw uh, yeah. was, was really influential but um, Father Kelvin is here and has much more interesting things to say than me so um, I, will, I will hand over to him